I must admit that I too, among hundreds of millions of educated people, was under the impression that the African slave trade was the sole responsibility of the Christian Europeans, the white race. That is, until I started exploring the subject in greater depth, and especially after reading an incredibly enlightening book called The Legacy of Arab Islam in Africa by John Alambilla Azuma. My whole perspective and understanding has changed dramatically, and I would like you to tell us more about this subject. The success of Muhammadan Islam in deceiving, misinforming, deforming, and contorting both history and reality over a period of almost 1400 years has been astounding. That is, until now. The greatest strategy about this particular subject is that most of the descendants of African slavery, the black people in the Americas, around the world, as well as among the African blacks, are totally ignorant of the actual facts. Before we lose the concentration of our listeners, I would like to make the following statement and then prove it. That the worst, most inhumane and most diabolical institution of the black African slave trade was initiated, refined, perpetrated and implemented by the Mohammedan Arabs and later aided and abetted by the black converts to Mohammedan Islam. I predict that as usual, the two subcultures, those of denial of facts and of political correctness, will attack us without once disproving a single statement and or conclusion that we make. Slavery was not created by the white races, because it has existed throughout human history and practiced by every tribe, culture, civilization, racial group and religion. In fact, the very word slavery has its root in the name Slav, based upon the Slavic peoples of Europe who were subjugated by other Europeans. It is not common knowledge that the Arabic word Abd is synonymous with the meaning of slave. For example, Abdullah means literally the slave of Allah, and that in the language of the Arabs, all black peoples are called Abid, plural, for slaves. While much has been written concerning the transatlantic slave trade, Surprisingly, little attention has been paid to the Islamic slave trade across the Sahara, the Red Sea, and the Indian Ocean. While the European involvement in the African transatlantic slave trade to the Americas lasted for just over three centuries, the Arab involvement in the African slave trade has lasted 14 centuries, and in some parts of the Mohammedan world is still continuing to this day. The birth of Mohammedan Islam and its conquests brought about the birth of institutionalized, systematized, and religiously sanctioned slave trade on a massive and global scale. In fact, the Quran allows the taking of slaves as booty or reward for wars of aggression against any and all unbelievers, most of the human population. This has led to an enormous number of so-called holy wars, jihad in Arabic. There was and is absolutely nothing holy about these wars which are primarily to plunder, slaughter, rape, subjugate and rob other human beings of their wealth, produce, freedom and dignity. Mohammedan Muslim states and tribes attacked other non-Muslim groups to achieve these objectives. Although Islamic jurisprudence laid down regulations for the treatment of slaves, however, Incredible and heinous abuses have occurred throughout the history of Muhammadan Islam. By the Middle Ages, the Arab, Arabic word Abid was in general used to denote a black slave, while the word Mamluk referred to a white slave. Ibn Khaldun, 1332 to 1406, the preeminent Islamic medieval historian and social thinker wrote, the Negro nations are as a rule submissive to slavery because they have attributes that are quite similar to dumb animals. It should also be noted that black slaves were castrated based on the assumption that the blacks had an ungovernable sexual appetite. When the Fatimid Caliphate came to power in Egypt, they slaughtered all the tens of thousands of black military slaves and raised an entirely new slave army. Some of these slaves were conscripted into the army at age 10. From Persia, to Egypt, to Morocco, slave armies from 30,000 to up to 250,000 became commonplace. 
The Islamic slave trade took place across the Sahara Desert, from the coast of the Red Sea, and from East Africa across the Indian Ocean. The Trans-Sahara trade was conducted along six major slave routes. Just in the 19th century, for which we have more accurate records, 1.2 million slaves were brought across the Sahara into the Middle East, as well as a further 450,000 down the Red Sea and 442,000 from the East African coastal ports. That is a total of 2 million black slaves, just in the 1800s. At least 8 million more were calculated to have died before reaching the Muslim slave markets. A comparison of the Islamic slave trade to the American slave trade reveals some extremely interesting contrasts. While two out of every three slaves shipped across the Atlantic were men, the proportions were reversed in the Islamic slave trade. Two women for every man were enslaved by the Muslims. While the mortality rate of slaves being transported across the Atlantic was as high as 10%, the percentage of slaves dying in transit in the Trans-Sahara and East African slave market was a staggering 80 to 90%. While almost all the slaves shipped across the Atlantic were for agricultural work, most of the slaves destined for the Muslim Middle East were for sexual exploitation as concubines, in harems, and for military service. While many children were born to the slaves in the Americas, the millions of their descendants are citizens in Brazil and the United States of today, very few descendants of the slaves that ended up in the Middle East survive. While most slaves who went to the Americas could marry and have families, most of the male slaves destined for the Middle East were castrated and most of the children born to the women were killed at birth. It is estimated that possibly as many as 11 million Africans were transported across the Atlantic, 95% of which went to South and Central America, mainly to Portuguese, Spanish and French possessions. Only 5% of the slaves ended up in what we call the United States today. However, a minimum of 28 million Africans were enslaved in the Muslim Middle East. Since at least 80% of those captured by Muslim slave traders were calculated to have died before reaching the slave markets, it is believed that the death toll from 1400 years of Arab and Muslim slave raids into Africa could have been as high as 112 millions. When added to the number of those sold in the slave markets, the total number of African victims of the trans-Saharan and East African slave trade could be significantly higher than 140 million people. What is obscene about this whole subject is the Mohammedan Muslim and Arab culture of denial regarding their complicity in the African slave trade, as well as the ignorance of black Muslims about the reality of their past and present conditions. The statistics and reports above are based upon the logbooks kept at the African slave ports, ship logs, travelers' reports, eyewitness accounts, etc. Ladies and gentlemen, the facts and reality of Mohammedan Islam's complicity in the slave trade and their inhuman depravity are infinitely more devastating, more staggering, and more incomprehensible than all the nightmare fictions in the world. Från en smörsångare till en annan. Den som jag nu åsyftar är det Emil Ford. Han heter en sångare som underhåller oss på sex. It is a fact that the majority of the followers of Muhammad, over one billion of them, are illiterate in the Arabic language and hence must trust and depend on their mullahs to explain the Quran to them. Based upon your research of the subject, as well as upon your personal contacts with different Mohammedan nationalities, what are your conclusions? I must emphasize repeatedly that a believer will not be swayed by logic or facts, which would undermine his or her beliefs. They must be able to ignore as well as deny both reality and facts. My experiences even with many of the highly educated Mohammedan Muslims, any and all my proofs are ignored without challenge. Nonetheless, let us share a few examples with our listeners. Sahih Bukhari Hadith 1.777 narrated by Abu Salama. In the morning of the 20th of Ramadan, 
The Prophet delivered a sermon saying, whoever has performed the tiqaf with me should continue it. I have been shown the night of Al-Qadr, but have forgotten its date. But it is in the odd nights of the last ten nights. Sahih Muslim Hadith 2631, narrated by Abdullah ibn Unais. Allah Messenger said, I was shown Laylat Al-Qadr, then I was made to forget it. Muhammad, the self-proclaimed greatest of all the other prophets, could not remember the date of the most momentous event in his life, the night of revelation of the first verse of the Quran. Since Muhammad could not even remember the date of a recent and extremely important event and was not able to predict any future event, by what standard of logic could he be called a prophet? Sahih Muslim Hadith 328 narrated by Abu Huraira. The Messenger of Allah said, I found myself in Hijr and the Quraysh were asking me about my night journey. I was asked about things pertaining to Bayt al-Maqdis, Temple of Solomon, which I could not preserve in my mind. I forgot. I was very much vexed, so vexed as I had never been before. Once more, does Muhammad admit to his fallible memory? Yet again, Muhammad could not remember another momentous event in his life. Muhammad forgot what the Temple of Solomon looked like, the very same that he had only visited a few hours earlier, and led prayers at the head of all the previous Hebrew prophets on his alleged miraculous night journey. The listener should be aware that in the year 622 AD there was no Temple of Solomon in existence since it had already been destroyed by the Romans 550 years earlier. Muhammad was actually deliberately and mendaciously deceiving his gullible but believing followers. Sahih Bukhari Hadith 1.394 narrated by Abdullah. The Prophet turned his face to us and said, If there had been anything changed in the prayer, surely I would have informed you, but I'm a human being like you and liable to forget like you. So if I forget, remind me. Sahih Bukhari Hadith 3.244 narrated by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. The Prophet said, whoever was in itiqaf with me should stay in itiqaf for the last ten days. For I was informed of the date of the night of Qadr, but I have been caused to forget it. Sahih Bukhari Hadith 6.550 narrated by Abdullah. The Prophet said, it is a bad thing that some of you say, I have forgotten such and such a verse in the Quran. For indeed, he has been caused by Allah to forget it. So you must keep on reciting the Quran because it escapes from the hearts of men faster than camels do. Sahih al-Bukhari hadith 6.558 narrated by Aisha. Allah apostle heard a man reciting the Quran at night and said, May Allah bestow his mercy on him as he has reminded me of such and such verses of and such and such surahs which I was caused to forget. Sahih Bukhari Hadith 6.559 narrated by Abdullah. The Prophet said, Why does any one of the people say I have forgotten such and such a verse in the Quran? He in fact is caused by Allah to forget. It was typical of Muhammad never to admit error or fault, but blame everything on outside agents such as Allah Gabriel, Satan, Quraysh, Jews, etc. The followers of Muhammad at the present time walk perfectly in his footsteps by always denying any wrongdoing and blaming everything on others.